Joining us now, Dan Manili. He is professor in the Faculty of Energy Systems and Nuclear Science at UOIT, the University of Ontario Institute of Technology. We should also point out you're a former chief engineer at AECL, Atomic Energy of Canada. Um, Bruce Powers' Duncan Hawthorne was in that chair yesterday, and yes. I want to know, since he sat there in the past 24 hours, what developments in Japan have caught your eye and interested you the most? Well, the explosion at Unit 2 in Daiichi certainly caught my eye, my ear, and everything else. It, uh, it was, again, a hydrogen explosion, apparently, but this time more serious than the, than the first two. It seemed to have happened somewhere in the middle of the plant, in the midst of the plant. And I don't know, I don't think anyone knows exactly where that happened and what the result was. Why does that make it more serious? Well, before, the first two explosions we experienced, they were outside the containment structure, the primary containment. They blew the roof off the, the building, and uh, hydrogen explosions will do that from time to time. But this one is in the part of the plant that contains the water that keeps the fuel cool. That's what's important about this one. And it may have damaged that inner containment and allowed leakage to occur. Not a good thing. Leakage of? Leakage of water, primarily. Yeah. Which is radioactive. It, yeah, it probably is. Certainly by now it should be. Dan, you've brought something in. You've brought yes, a prop in. Why don't you pick it up and put it on the table, and, and well, we'll start a series of questions on this and the significance of it to what's happening in Japan. What is that? That's a real can-do fuel bundle without any uranium in it, I might add. That's good to know. <laughs> And this is what we talk about as the cladding or the fuel sheath. And these are the fuel rods that we talk about. They're not the same as in the Japanese reactor, but for in all intents and purposes, they look very much the same. It's not the same because theirs is a Westinghouse and yours is ACL? Yeah, ours is superior, of course. Of course, yeah. <laughs> now, tell us, the part of the story right now is focusing on those fuel rods, and yeah. they're, they're white hot right now, right? They, they are partly hot. Some of them are hot. In the Japanese reactor, Steve, they stand vertically. Mm -hmm. And they're normally they're covered with water for a very large depth. And they're running short of water. And the water boils away and boils away. And the damage begins when the water gets below the top of these rods. These cans, these metal cans, heat up. And they crack and they melt. And inside those cans is the uranium that does all the work in a normal situation. It produces the heat that we make electricity with. So if the water goes below the top of those things and they start to melt and that uranium suddenly becomes exposed, yep. then what? Then there's some of the fission products, some of the radioactive material that's inside the uranium. Normally it's stuck inside. It's a material like a, a coffee cup, a broken coffee cup. But it, when it gets very hot, it crumbles and releases some of the radioactive materials. And when you say release, it's going out into the air. Well, it's going out into the inside of the containment. So you, you see the primary containment and how important it is. Yeah. But if, if, it, if that gets too hot, presumably they have to open the lid from that primary containment, and then it goes beyond yeah. there. Yeah, they don't open the lid, but they open a valve. A the valve, same sorry, thing. okay. So the, the steam that's produced by the, all this boiling raises the pressure, and that opposes the force of the pump that they want to use to put in more cool water. Do so these things catch fire? They don't really catch fire in that sense. What happens is this is zirconium alloy. And when it gets very hot, around 1,000 degrees Celsius, very, very hot in kitchen terms, it's certainly a hot, hot unit. So when it gets very hot, the water and the zirconium react. The zirconium takes the oxygen away from the water, and what's left is hydrogen. And that's what's exploding right now. That's what's explosive, yeah. And so the hydrogen and the oxygen, they go up with the steam, and they're passed through a water pool, and then they go out to the outside. So while they're in the water pool, most of the radioactive materials get washed in into the water itself. Some of them go right through, and the hydrogen and the oxygen goes right through. 
And so it can, the two can recombine, can mix again into water. When they do that, they release a lot of energy and you hear it as a bang. That's the explosion. I, I've got to tell you, to a non-scientist, this all sounds pretty terrible. Is this pretty terrible? No, it's not. And because after all, this, these Daiichi units, they've been shut down for four days now. The fission reaction, the chain reaction, stopped four days ago. And so now they're only working on decay heat. They're producing decay heat. It's like a dying embers of a fireplace. It's still producing heat. And you really want to control the temperature because you don't want to see the metal produce more oxygen or more hydrogen and oxygen and crumble more fuel. You don't want that fuel to break up. So how hot are these things right now? They're sort of boiling temperature, 100 degrees Celsius, 212 Fahrenheit. So they're water boiling uh, just like your coffee cup in the morning, coffee uh, urn in the morning. Now the people who are still at the reactor working mm -hmm. to try to get this situation under control, is their health now in jeopardy because of the fact that they're still there? There may be one or two that have their health in jeopardy to some degree. Again, it's a matter of degree. Mm -hmm. but. As far as I understand from the International Atomic Energy Commission, the only person that has reached a serious level of personal irradiation is one person got 10 Röntgen equivalent man radiation dose. That's, that would take him away from all radioactive uh, work for two years. It's what he would get as a limit regulation wise. From a legal point of view, he shouldn't get more than 10 rem in two years. Okay. He got it in a few days. Okay, help me help, again. Help us with this because the 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 way you folks measure exposure to radiation mm -hmm. is not like feet, inches, meters, centimeters, which we understand. You do it with a different measuring stick, which we're not as we non-scientists are not as familiar with. But from mm -hmm. what I understand, some of the people who've been working in there have been exposed to a hundred times the levels you're supposed to the so-called safe yeah. limits mm -hmm. that you're supposed to be exposed to. Now again, to my untrained mind, yeah. that does not sound good, Dan. It's not good. Yeah. But it, it's still that uh, what we're supposed to be exposed to is the natural background level. So we get that every day. And the allowable extra radiation that you're, a normal a, a civilian, say, is allowed to get is only about one more level that high, so twice the natural background, and that's the limit. But these people are professionals that are trained and, and trained for years sometimes to, to protect themselves against excessive radiation. They know if they know a place of radiation, they go away from it, they stay away as long as they can. If they must go near it, they stay as little time as they can. Okay. And when they can put a shield between themselves and the radiation, they do so. Okay. They're we, professionals. We want to get a perfectly clean shot of you now. So if you're finished with this, you can put that back on the floor. Okay. And we'll move on from there. Uh, you, you talked about putting everything in perspective, and I get that. So I want to ask, how great do you think the danger is from the storage ponds compared to the damaged reactors? Compare the, the yeah. level of danger, if you would. The storage ponds look kind of like the reactor. There's fuel stored in them. There's fuel from previous years of operation. So it's produced all the electricity it's ever going to produce. Still producing a little bit of heat. And it's decreasing steadily with time for each and every bundle. But somewhere in each of those pools, there will be some used fuel or spent fuel that has quite recently put in, been put in. So it's generating a substantial amount of heat. And it's, normally it's taken away in circulation. But those poor fellows have lost all their electrical power. They've lost all their fresh water. And here's a, a pond of, of sensitive steel, metal material that you do, really don't want to put salt water on top of. If you've driven a boat in the ocean, you know what. But, but that's what they're doing, right? That's what they must do because yeah. they have no choice. They're taking the water from the ocean to cool yeah. it. But you've noticed that in the, in the ponds, have decided to fly in fresh water with helicopters. Okay. That's why they're doing that. It's because it's fresh water and won't damage the bundles inside the pool. Which the salt water would do. It would do, yes. Okay. Tell us this. We keep hearing, uh, again, 
tone is important here, and I don't want to be alarmist, but we do hear when you turn on other channels, you know, fears of a core meltdown and all of this yes. kind of stuff. Yes. What does that mean? There's a lot of natural fear. And, uh, oh, it goes back all the way to Jane Fonda and the... Three Mile Island. Uh, before Three Mile Island. <laughs> that Jane Fonda and the... Uh, what is it? The, the China, China Syndrome, syndrome the movie? Where the hypothesis is that if the core melts, it'll go all the way to China. Right. However, this is not that scenario at all because these fuel bundles, fuel elements, have been cooling off for four days now. They don't take much water to, to, uh, to keep them cool. I did a little calculation today. Uh, a bucket brigade carrying 350 pails of water each hour to that reactor would be enough to keep it cool. That's not a big bucket brigade in scale of things. That's an easy thing to do. And they're using seawater, so they have plenty of it. Are they having trouble, though, keeping this thing cool? They're having trouble because they're short of electricity. They're short of fresh water. They're out of fresh water, so they're taking it out of the ocean. They really wouldn't like to do that normally. But they don't have a choice in that disastrous climate in Japan. Uh, one more thing on radiation. The New York Times has been reporting that, quote, the explosion released a surge of radiation 800 times more intense than the recommended hourly exposure limit in Japan. Yes. And again, this is not dealing specifically with the guys who are working at the plant. This is now for the entire population. Mm -hmm. How concerned should the Japanese people be that they've been exposed to too much radiation? Well, if they're, if they're living or standing very close to the plant, they should be concerned and they should leave. Following the, the professional's uh, advice, if you're near a radiation source, get further away. And so you reduce the dose, dose rate, the amount of radiation you get. So that, that burst of radiation last night followed the ex third explosion. And at the overnight, the, the rate of radiation release, radioactive material release, has gone down substantially since then. And unless we get another series of explosions, which I don't expect, I don't think there'll be any more problem there other than the poor fellows that have to keep mm -hmm. that water in there. We've also heard some reports, I gather, that uh, you know, the radiation may have drifted as far as British Columbia. Should we be concerned about that? Uh, I heard that, and I thought to myself, people don't understand when they're further from the radiation source, the danger becomes progressively less, mm -hmm. as at least the square of the distance from that source. And they're how far, 8,000 miles away? Mm -hmm. They're pretty good in pretty good shape. So it'd be like having an x-ray or two a day? Is that oh, the, less than that. Less than that even. Less than that. The people to worry about are the Japanese people who are in relatively close, and the workers are the highest rate, the ones to worry about. Of course. Dan, uh, a confusing story to be sure, and a sad one as well, but we're grateful that you could come in tonight with your fuel casing there and uh, help us understand a little bit better about what's going on. Thanks so yeah. much. Most welcome, Steve. Thank you. Dan Manili, former chief engineer of AECL.